This morning we're going to talk about the kingdom of God and what that is. And what do we need to be doing? Interestingly, uh, yesterday I was doing a bunch of stuff at home. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and for some reason, I have no, no idea why, all week, I thought this was Jim's week to preach. So I was kind of surprised yesterday. I go like, I'm preaching tomorrow. That's okay. It's a good thing. I mean, I like it. It's good. Thank you. So before we get into the kingdom of God, let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. So many things you've communicated to us, and we can all have it, and we can all read it, and we can all come to you with it, and you can explain it to each and every one of us as we seek the truth about your word. Let us see what you have in here for us today, Lord, and touch our hearts, touch our minds. Let these words of yours change our lives. Let us act upon what we hear. Ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> yeah, otherwise it's going to be kind of impromptu. Um, so the kingdom of God. This is a phrase used mainly in the Gospels of Mark and in Luke. In the Gospel of Matthew, they, it's more called the kingdom of heaven. That's the same thing, same place, same people. But what caught me here was a couple weeks ago in, in Sunday school, and it was the, Jesus telling someone to follow him. And so I kind of wanted to take a, a more in-depth look of what he was talking about here. So what is the kingdom of God? Well, for one, it's the kingdom where Jesus is the king. In Matthew 25, 34, it says, Then the king, this is Jesus, and this is kind of an interesting chapter Matthew 25 and it's really interesting in this section in chapter 25 where Jesus as a man is telling his disciples and whoever else was there listening the king and he was referring to himself so it's really interesting he's referring to himself in a future tense or future state so it says, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So it's the kingdom where Jesus is the king. The clue, the clue there, he says, my father, and we all know Jesus referred to God the father as his father. So we know Jesus is referring to himself. This is really cool. It's the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom where Jesus is the king. It's also where Jesus is king in his revealed state. We've got to realize when we're seeing Jesus in the Gospels, we're not seeing him revealed. And I was kind of having a hard time coming up with a way to explain this. But in Luke chapter 20, or chapter 9, verse 27, Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples. But he says this very interesting verse. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And he's referring to... This next couple of verses, when they go up on the mountain and they see Jesus transfigured, he says, Some eight days after saying, after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. 
Jesus, in short, is the kingdom of God. This is very little bit of this understanding this on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you want to see Jesus fully revealed, there's a whole book written about it. It's called Revelation. Where it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when he is revealed and when he is king, it will be a completely different kingdom. But it's also the, the new proclamation. Matthew 16, 16 to 17, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And he says, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached. So there was a change when John came on the scene. This is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. When he went proclaiming the way of the Lord. Because the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, and since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been, been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. There's a lot of controversy on what that means. But people working very hard to get their way into the kingdom of God. But he also put in this very important note. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. The gospel of the kingdom of God does not replace the law and the prophets. In actuality, it enhances it. It brings it more to real, to realism. So the kingdom of God really is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And it's the kingdom where Jesus is the king. So that's why he's telling everybody the kingdom of God is near, or the kingdom of heaven is near in Matthew. And go tell them the kingdom of God is come near to you. And he even says in one point to the Pharisees, they say, when will the kingdom of God come? He says, it's not like there's going to be an announcement or anything, but the kingdom of God is in your midst. But Jesus was standing right there in front of them when he said that. But it's also kind of a more, in a sense, a spiritual kingdom. But the important thing is the kingdom of God. Now Jesus tells us to proclaim the kingdom of God. And this is where I was caught. This, this, these verses caught me. Jesus was talking to his disciples around on the road. And some scribe or Pharisee comes up and says, you know, teacher, I'll follow you anywhere. And he says, the foxes have holes and the birds have trees, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And the thing about that is that person was discouraged from following Jesus. But then here's the next one. And he said to another, follow me. He kind of discourages one person, but then he says to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, and this is the important thing for us, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Now, when this person was saying, I want to bury my father first, his father wasn't dead. The implication is, I will come and follow you after I've taken care of these other things. Now, when Jesus says, follow me, Jesus knows about those other things. And he's telling you to follow him anyway. But the thing here is, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. So Jesus tells us to proclaim the kingdom of God, and he says, what do we proclaim? What is the kingdom of God? How do we tell people about the kingdom of God? Now, you remember one of my favorite stories is the demoniac. Jesus and his disciples cross over the Sea of Galilee. 
fight a horrendous storm, which Jesus calms by telling it to stop. They get to the other side. They go up on the, the hillside. I'm, uh, I have a picture in my head. It's a hillside. One person there, a guy full of demons, he's got a thousand demons living in him. And he casts those demons out. They go into the swine and the pigs go jump into the lake. And the people there tell him to leave. But the demoniac, he wanted to come back with Jesus. What does Jesus tell him? Jesus says to this man, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. How many Bible classes do you think this demoniac went through? There you go to seminary. You see, I can't tell people about God until I've learned everything there is to learn about God. Your testimony is the most important thing you have. It's the best tool you have to tell others. Go and describe what great things God has done for you. That's all we need to do. We don't need to have a Bible degree. We just need to be telling people what God did for us. And no one knows that story better than you do. And no one knows my story better than I do. But go and describe what great things God has done for you. And he went and did so. What has God done for you? Even if you didn't have a thousand demons cast out of you, Jesus has done something for you. The number one most important thing that Jesus has done is he's redeemed us back to God. Man's sins, which separates us from God, that's described in Genesis chapter 3. And God does everything to bring us back to him, and that's described in the rest of the Bible. This book, there's a lot of things in it that are historical. There's a lot of things in it that are prophetic. And if my Bible wasn't falling apart, and I wasn't losing things out of it, it'd be easier to pick up. This is the story of God redeeming men. Now, we don't need to understand everything in it. Do you understand everything in it? No. Do I understand everything in it? I've been studying and teaching this book for 40 years. I'm scratching the surface. But I can still tell people what Jesus did. What he did was he paid the price for redemption as we couldn't pay for it ourselves. In Romans 3.23, Paul writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the glory of God. We are all sinners. Everybody you talk to is a sinner. Everybody you've seen on the street is a sinner. We all have sinned, and we fall short of the glory of God. In order to get into heaven, you must be perfect, or you must pay for those sins. It also tells us, 623, for the wages of sin is death. We can't pay that on our own. Jesus, who is without sin is the only one who could pay that. So you see signs. Jesus died for you. Jesus saved you from your sin. What? Why? Because we can't. It's all about Jesus. And the gospel is pretty simple. God came. He died on the cross for our sins. And he was resurrected on the third day. 
to prove and show that he what he said is true. If death was not required, if the wages of sin was not death, if there was another way, God would have done it. It's not as simple as two Hail Marys and an Our Father. That does not pay for sin. What pays for sin is blood. Now, why did God make it that way? I mean, his universe, his rules, right? Why did he make it so hard to pay for sin? But the only way we could have our sin paid for was through him. We must develop that relationship with Christ because he is our savior because he alone can save us. That's what Jesus did for us. And it was so we could be in the kingdom. I've left out that last part that was highlighted. The wages of sin of de is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. He doesn't charge us for it. It's because he loves us that he gives us eternal life. It's because he loves us that he paid the price for the sin. And it's so that we could be in the kingdom of God. When Jesus says to follow him, what do we do? We're to follow him. Now he said this to his apostles when he brought them on. He said, follow me. They dropped everything they were doing and followed him. He said this to other people. They're like, no, let me go bury my dad. He said to another person, he said, let me go say goodbye to people. But Paul, or no, Peter had brought this up. No, this is not Peter. This is the last part of this guy. And he said to another, follow me. He said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. Okay. There's not other things that are more important than following Jesus. If he says, follow me, he's already taking care of the other stuff. But go and proclaim everywhere. Even if you don't go to India to preach to those people about the kingdom of God, everywhere you go, you proclaim the kingdom of God. Even if you wait to go bury your father, everywhere you go, you proclaim the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter where you are, you proclaim the, work, the kingdom of God. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added. The most important thing we can do in this life is follow Jesus. Proclaim the kingdom of God. Seek first his kingdom. Not your own comfort. Not burying your father, not saying goodbye to people, not doing this, not doing that. I'll tell you a story kind of I'm a little bit ashamed of. I wanted to be a preacher when I was a lot younger. And I thought, you know, I'll have, I'll go and invite all the neighbors over to our condo. Diane and I were living in a condo at the time. And I go, no, I'll wait till I'm 30. Because Jesus was 30. Well, guess what happened when I turned 30? I didn't go and invite all those people. I came up with an excuse to put it off. To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Jesus says, you don't need to worry about anything. Now, you may not have a place to lay your head. And you may not have a place to sleep. You may not have a ton of food. You may not have a grocery store. You may not have money. 
But Jesus says, don't worry about those things. Take first his kingdom. He'll take care of those other things. We were just in, you know, the section in Luke where he was sending out 70 disciples. He said, don't take a money purse. Don't take an extra cloak. Don't take an extra pair of shoes. Don't take this. Don't take a sword. Don't worry about it. Because he's going to provide for it. He wants us to have faith in his provision, not faith in our provision. I've also said this morning, I tried the uh, lotto card with God. Hey, if you just let me win the lotto, I can do all this good stuff for you. Like, you don't need to win the lotto to do that good stuff. You need to do it. Don't put it off. And that's what he says another place we'll get to. Luke 18, 29, 30, he says, Truly I say to you, there is not one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come life. This is when Peter said, hey, Lord, we left everything for you. And he says, yes, you did. And this is what you get. Peter was married. He left his wife. They left their business. Jesus says, you will receive many times as much at this time, meaning in this age, and in the age to come, you have eternal life. One of the key important things that Jesus told these 70 disciples, sorry I'm stealing a little bit from the lesson today, you know, they come back and they say, hey, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Key phrase, in your name. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. He says, yes, that's all great and wonderful, but nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. We don't need to worry about building up a name for ourselves here. If you do that, you have your reward in full. Jesus says, do those things, but not for the sake of doing those things. Because they're the right thing to do but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Not on this earth what matters. It matters what we do with our time, but it doesn't matter what our accomplishments are. Remember Noah. Preaching for a hundred years, a flood's coming, get in the boat. And you're like, we don't even know what a flood is. We don't know what rain is, and we don't believe you. But when that boat was sealed up and the rain came, where do you think they were knocking? It was too late. The door was closed. You need to come when the invitation's open, not when the invitation's closed. I don't even know why I said that now. Anyway. Jesus is not telling people not to leave their house, not to leave their brothers, not to leave their parents, not to leave their children. He's telling them, if you leave them for the sake of the kingdom of God, because I've told you to, you will have very great reward. Most importantly, eternal life versus eternal death. This was the last one in Luke 7, that Luke 9. I don't know why I keep things Luke 7. Luke 9. Last person. Another one also said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. read some commentary, there's been lots of people who had intention 
of following Jesus, but wanted to go do something else first. Wanted to go say goodbye rather than just go. They never made it back. And Jesus says this, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. A good example of this is Lot's wife. They were told, do not look back. She looked back. We don't know all the reasons of stories why. But she looked back. And it's the, the idea of there is a longing of the time before. I've heard a lot of people talk about the good old days when they could sin and party. Those aren't good old days. If you think about those as the good old days, you need, you need to be talking to God about that. Because those are the days that we should not be wanting to remember. But Jesus, and these are his words, no one, after putting his hand to the plow, meaning they decided to follow God, and they're going forward, and they're doing what God has told them to do, if they look back and go, I'm remembering life back then, they're not fit for the kingdom of God. We shouldn't be looking back. We need to be looking forward. And here's some stuff from Paul. Maybe. One more. There we are. Press on. In Philippians chapter 3, this is the section of Scripture when Paul is talking about people who are proud about what things they've done in their life, their personal accomplishments. And Paul is saying, no one has more right to be proud of their accomplishments than I have. I was born a Jew in the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. So well, let me just go to it. It's always easier if I do this this way. To give the context. Paul says to the people, he says, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are of the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Those are Paul's personal Accomplishments. Now, he didn't really have a whole lot to do with being born in the tribe of Benjamin or a lot to do with being circumcised on the eighth day. But what he's saying is, I've, my whole life, I've followed the law. Perfect. As, as far as, uh, he says, a Hebrew of Hebrew, as to the law, Pharisee. Pharisees followed the letter of the law. As to zeal a persecutor of the church. Paul is a very zealous Pharisee to the point, you know, he believed the church to be false, so he went out, set out to destroy it. We have all that story in the book of Acts. He was very zealous for God. 
to the point where he was out to destroy the church because he believed it to be false. As to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. He says this about those things, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. All of the accomplishments, all of the things he had done before, he like, a waste of time to even think about that stuff. It's garbage compared to knowing Jesus. It says that I may gain Christ and may be found in him. He's like, I'm found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul's whole life has changed. This was a man who lived by the law, persecuted people for not following the law. And he's like, the law is nothing to me anymore because I know Jesus. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. See, Paul put himself to the plow, and he always looked forward. There's a lot of commentary on that. You know, if you're a plow person, you pick a point and you go straight to that point. If you turn around and you're looking back, you can't plow a straight line. Straight lines were important. Are you saying he has suffered tremendously because he's known Christ and he's like, that's what I'm after. He's not after the suffering, he's after knowing Christ and whatever that cost is. Jesus, before he said this stuff about you know, the plow and whatnot said, if anyone wishes to follow me, he must pick up his cross daily. And we saw today Jesus telling his disciples, if they listen to you, they listen to me. If they don't listen to you, if they deny you, they deny me, and they deny the one who sent me. That you will be persecuted for my name's sake. But it's not you they're persecuting it. And then he, Paul continues, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ. His brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. Press on, look forward. Don't look behind. If you start looking back, Jesus says, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. That's the mark that we follow. That's what we go after. Why? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We do these things for God. We press on for God. We want to have our name written in heaven. Not because we want to have a name written on earth, which is going to burn up, by the way, in case you haven't read. Press on for following Jesus and doing what he has called us to do. The kingdom of God is 
Jesus. It's not so easy to see it when he appears as a man. But when he appears as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, it will be obvious that the kingdom of God is Jesus. And that's what we proclaim. We proclaim Jesus because the people we are proclaiming him to, Jesus died for, paid their sin, just like he paid ours. Right. Heavenly Father, you are so clear in your word. I pray, Lord, that we come to you daily, looking forward to you, following you, going after you, working to get closer and closer to you and proclaiming you to those around us. Wherever we go and whatever we do, we proclaim the kingdom of God. Be with us, Lord, this time. Give us strength. Make clear your calling for each and every In your name we pray. Amen.